Welcome to Tanak Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Two Guys Exploring Christianity. Jonathan McClatchy, welcome back. My friend, it's good to, good to see you again. I know we had an uh, interesting conversation before, and we're looking forward to another interesting one today. So welcome back, my friend. How are you today? Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are awesome. you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, yeah. So, um, so we're just going to uh, we're, today. We're going to basically treat this like we're three guys at a coffee shop. Okay. Uh, for for the viewers out there, uh, this is um, uh, there's just there's just so much information. We're going to try to put it up, put this uh, particular show, this particular episode. We're going to try to put closure on this series because I've got so much going on right now. I don't really have a whole lot of freedom on time to to keep doing this particular show. So we're gonna we're going to try to just balance things back and forth today uh, with one verse at a time where nothing gets too overwhelmed uh, and everything can be covered without by the time we're done everything we will have discussed should probably be pretty much clear and open and out on the table by the time we're done with this episode so um, so welcome back and my friend Greg McBride Greg slow ride McBride I How like that <laughs> slow ride, that's slow ride. Right. Yeah, take I got it the, easy I got the coolest nickname on the channel <laughs> yes you do yes you do <laughs> yeah we found we have determined though that you, you one of you is Scottish and I'm actually Scott so I don't know which one's better <laughs> I don't know which yeah it's like I don't know it's kind of like the word Jewish are you a Jew or are you Jew-ish it's like, is it hot or is it hot-ish there? You know, <laughs> I just kidding. I don't know. We don't even know. We're I not going to go there. Yeah, we don't even know. We yep. Know. Very good. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. gentlemen, um, I, I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to kind of just kind of kick back. I'll definitely be having my input as well. Uh, but I really would like for uh, Greg to Greg. You look like you're chomping at the bit. Go for it, bro. I, well, I was I was going to say I was I received uh, the letter from Jonathan after the last show, and it was. 26 pages long. Thank you very much. <laughs> I knew that would be. And you made you made several points in your letter, and I I uh, I wanted to address them. And these are things that I've always wanted to have addressed when I was in the church, and I I never got any of these addressed. And I, I wanted to go particularly to your page um, uh, when it's the the title that you put on is "Does Jesus Deny His Deity." And you said that I brought up a couple of texts in the Gospels that I thought argued against the deity of Christ. And I did, I had just used those two. I used Mark 10, 18 and, and John 14, 28. And so this this is what I wanted, I wanted your comment on this. In in John 14, 28, where where Jesus says that the Father is greater than I. That's that's what he verbatim says. And your comment on there was that I was taking that that verse out of context. And I was hoping that you could clarify how how that would be how Jesus himself literally saying the Father is greater than I uh, in in 1428 of John, how should I understand that text? Sure. So we need to understand uh, any particular verse in John uh, in light of the Gospel of John as a whole, and that's a sound uh, um, ex exegetical principle. And we should let uh, more ambiguous passages be interpreted by clearer passages. Um, now, in the immediate context of John 1428, uh, if we with the the whole verse we read and i quote you heard me say to you i'm going away and i will come to you if you love me you would rejoice because i'm going to the father for the father is greater than i now we might wonder okay so why, why are the disciples at, uh, why should they be rejoicing that jesus is returning to the father um and the reason that jesus gives is that well the father is greater than he now, why should that be a cause for rejoicing? Well, the answer is given in verses 12 through 14, where he reads, and I quote, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So... The reason that Jesus is going back to the Father um, should cause the disciples to rejoice, because... The son is now going to reclaim. Jonathan, please uh, forgive, forgive me real quickly. So the, the argument is that so Jesus proclaims that he's not the father. He even says that in what you're saying, I'm going to the father. How can the father go exactly. to the father? 
so so we don't believe that the son is the father right we believe that these are separate persons so uh the doctrine of the trinity maintains that there's one divine being and, and three divine co-eternal persons namely the father son and spirit um but when, when jesus returns to the father uh um then that that's to cause rejoicing among the disciples because he's reclaiming the glory and divine privilege which had rightfully been his uh alongside the father from eternity past um that, that privilege that he laid aside voluntarily uh at the time of the incarnation you see that for example in the carmen christi in philippians 2 5 through 11. okay and, i'm, I'm uh, having a fact, really I'm, I'm just having a hard time following you because i thought what we were talking about right now is you're you're trying to show us that jesus is jesus claims to be god no, I'm not actually. Well, it's well, the opposite. I'm responding, to, I'm responding to a claim that Greg made Correct. that Jesus well, is not God. Well, well, well that's the whole point. No, you're, Jesus, you're, you're, right? Jesus is not God. That is the point. But you're trying, you're trying to prove that He is. Is that is that where we're going? Yeah, this wouldn't be my go-to passage if I was going to be demonstrating. Oh, that, I would hope not, because that does that actually says the opposite. It actually says that no, He's not God. Um, <laughs> so if we read just just um, a couple of chapters later in John 17, verse 5, we read, Jesus say, Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so, according to, I'm sure you're familiar with, this, that 42, 8, which says, uh, I'm the Lord, I give, I give my glory to no other, or my praise to carved idols. Uh, so Jesus is claiming that he, when he returns to the Father, he's going to be, uh, regaining the glory that he had voluntarily laid aside during the incarnation. But here's uh, the but here's the but the problem I have there is um, and again we, we're going to, this is like conversation not not like like I'm not going to give Greg five minutes and then you five minutes no this we're going to just have an interruptive conversation because these things this is kind of how I think we need to finish this. So the problem is throughout Tanakh uh, where Hashem speaks Hashem meaning God the Creator uh, he says he says. Yud Hey Vav Hey, that's my name. He spells it out for us so we can identify it by script what his name actually is. He says, That's my name, right? Uh, but so if Jesus' name was also the Yud, the Hey, the Vav, the Hey, that, that could have a little bit more weight, but it's not. It's, it, in fact, it's, it's nowhere close to that. And so when he said, This is my name, I will give my, I will share my glory with no one. That means no one. That means there's no way Jesus could be sh have shared glory with with God because his name isn't Yudhe Vave. That's the whole point of giving us names is so we can identify people and identify things. We call a dog a dog, call a cat a cat. If we can give our dog a proper name, if we have multiple dogs, we know which dog we're talking to. So the proper name is what Jesus is lacking uh, for him to be sharing glory with the Creator. The name Jesus. Uh which is the Greek uh, equivalent of Yeshua. Um, there, there's different variances, but uh, it, it could be Yahushua or Yeshua. I mean, there's there's just different variances. But um, in any case, um, G the name Jesus is the name of the man uh, Christ. But it's still, uh, is, but it's still Christ's an identifiable name. name. Deuteronomy 13 verses one through five. It says, "If you have anybody who leads you to follow another god that we did not know." And they clearly did not know that name is never mentioned. You got to keep this right. in mind. It says, if anybody leads you to follow something, a God that you did not know, if I could find the word Jesus in the Tanakh somewhere, the name Jesus or the name Yehoshua that's referring to the, you know, a deity figure, then that would be okay. But Deuteronomy 13, it's a warning. It says, do not, do not go this route because you follow only the Yud, the He, the Vav, He, and that is it. Yeah, well, we would argue that Jesus is Yahweh. So so, so we don't believe that the Son is the Father, right? We believe that these are separate persons. Yeah, well, we would argue that Jesus is Yahweh. So, so, so we don't believe that the Son is the Father, right? We believe that these are separate persons. Yeah, well, we would argue that Jesus is Yahweh. So The name Jesus is not an eternal name. It is the name of the man, Christ Jesus, who... Um, okay, keep in mind, we're trying to prove this here, and you're giving us a theory that is no, not... That is not. objection. I'm not... I'm not using but I'm, use, but I'm using an, an objection for you that's actually scripture, and you're using an objection to me that's an opinion. I, we, we, we're, the whole point here is we're trying to use scripture to determine what's truth. And you're giving me a bunch of ideas, and I'm giving you scriptures. So, so we, we would argue that Jesus uh, has the name... Yahweh possesses the name Yahweh. Okay, pause, 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 pause. If you're going to argue that he has that name Yahweh, then that's what we need proof of right there. 
Okay, so does so the question is then, does Jesus actually identify himself with the God of Israel? Right? Que- my so question we, would be, if he does both. Again, we're, con- we're conversing here. Uh, he does both, and, and using a few that you have, but the majority of what he has, he, he distinguishes himself separate from the Creator. I'm going to the Father. He's very clear on that. So if you take, yeah, if, you have, if you have, if you have thirty verses, we don't you, believe the Father and the Son are the same person, right? That that is that is a heresy. That is Sabellianism or modalism. You don't believe he's the same person, but you believe he's God. Yeah. Correct. See, that's, that's just blowing my mind. Uh, I mean, the, the scriptures are very clear. God will not, he, he will not share his glory with this. See, this is what I would call circular reasoning. We say God will not share his glory with anybody, and his name is the yud the hey the vav the hey And he says, no one, no one, I will share my glory with no one. This is, glory belongs to me and me alone, right? And then we cover that, and we say, okay, we get that. And then we come over here, and now we're talking about him sharing the, sharing the glory again. And it's like, we can't forget what we just discussed. We've got to remember that and then add this to it. And if it doesn't work, we throw it out. But you're not wanting to throw it out because we never got past the point of his name is not yod heh Nowhere in Scripture, except for an opinion that you have. Well, as, as Yahweh have given other titles throughout the Hebrew Bible, well, of course, he's, uh, there, there's other sure, titles. Sure, but, but is any of those Jesus or Yeshua? No. That's the point. If um, he, he did use other names. And you bring up a really well, great point. He brought up all these other names that, you, that they're known by, right? But he didn't use the one that the New Testament is showing, which goes back to Deuteronomy 13 again. It says, a God that you did not know. They have no idea who Jesus is. They have no idea who Yehoshua would be if it was in the form of a deity. They have no idea. We believe in progressive revelation. There's no nothing in the Old Testament that well, precludes Yahweh from having other names. Okay, fact, again, does. again, you're, you're assuming things. I'm, I'm giving you scriptures that has warnings to it. And you're assuming things that violates those warnings. No, I'm not. Uh, the, the, as I've said, there are other names that are applied to Yahweh throughout Scripture, um, yeah. and uh, there's nothing in Scripture that precludes uh, the name Jesus being applied to Yahweh. That. Uh, so, so you're using the same theory, the same logic as you would do with the virgin birth narrative. Not yeah, as far as far as the Isaiah seven fourteen. Uh, you say, well, uh, Betula versus Alma. Well, just because it says one doesn't mean it can be the other. This is how this is how your logic is working. But the problem is, with that, with if it was going to be a virgin, it would have said virgin there. That's a very distinctive thing. If that's going to be a sign to all humanity, it would say virgin. It wouldn't say young woman there, right? But your logic is using the same logic on the virgin birth as you are here, and neither one of them work. Okay, I'm going to stick on one topic at a time. So let's stick with the deity of Christ for now, and then we can revisit other other topics. Well, here's as long as we stick with only that. Okay, this is going to be like an open conversation. So if we have to dabble in back and forth to make a point, fine, whatever. So that's okay. Uh, but just I, I just don't want to leave any stone unturned as we go along. Okay. If we put too much so on the let, table at one time, it's going to get forgotten. So uh, let, let's 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 talk about some of the positive texts that affirm the deity of Christ in the Gospels. So, um, for example, um, if we were to go to uh, let's go to John ten. So let's start from verse twenty-two. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colony of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, "How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly." Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Now, that, of course, is very probably an allusion to Psalm uh, Psalm 95, um, which uh, says, speaking about the um, Israelites in the wilderness, verse 6 and 7, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts at Meribah. So uh, he says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me, which I've already alluded to. That that refers to verse uh, Psalm 95. I give them eternal life. So notice Jesus says, I give them eternal life. No one except Yahweh could say that. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Oh, they could no say that, though. That's the whole point. Anybody, anybody could say that. 
We're not having a conversation. There's like 20 points in this one section. As you bring up a point, we need to be able to talk as we work ourselves through this. One yeah, verse, we said one, we time said time one verse at a time, not one, not one topic at a time. One topic could involve 60 verses. So we're going to have to take this thing little by little and be patient with each other and let us, let us work through this, okay? No, let me finish the argument. So verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand, which is an allusion to Deuteronomy 32, 39, where... Um, where we we'd see now that I even I am He, and besides me there is, uh, and besides me there is no God. Um, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Um, and so Jesus says that of Himself. And then verse twenty nine, My Father who has gr- who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And so He claims not just a unity of purpose, but a, a, an ontological unity with the Father. And the Jews understand exactly what he means, because in verse 31, they pick up stones to stone him, and Jesus says, I've shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, it is not for good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Um, and so G- Jesus claims divine status there. It seems pretty unequivocal to me. Okay, so you've got um, everything I've seen from, from the New Testament, there is like 30 places where he clearly says, I'm not. And maybe one or two that are shadowy that might be thinking maybe that could be misunderstood. If you left all the other, other 30 places out, then you could look at those two places and say, oh, yeah, he clearly claims to be God there. But what about the other 30 places where he claims not to be God? So here's the problem I have with Christianity. Their, their, their logic of reasoning is, for, for lack of better terms, it, it's, it's simply cherry picking. That that's the best thing I can think of, um, because it even in the thing that you quoted, he specifically says, "I am," you know, "I I do this in my Father's name," right? He didn't say, "I do it right. in my which, name," which is so what Trinitarians believe. <laughs> this is circular reasoning to me. This is what this seems like to me, so, Greg. I no, you're, I you're think assuming, I you're, you're assuming that Trinitarians believe that the Son is the Father. Tell, tell me any Trinitarian who believes that. Well, I I would like to, I think I can clarify John chapter 10 there, um, because we are, we are clearly told Jesus is uh, calling himself Elohim, not unlike the judges, not unlike Moses, not unlike uh, others in the, in other, in the Hebrew Bible, oftentimes men were called God. Jesus is saying, why are you going to stone me? All I'm doing is saying that I'm a judge of Israel because the judges were called Elohim. Mm. You have to go to the 17th chapter of John to understand the context of chapter 10 when Jesus says the exact same thing. He says, I and the Father are one as the disciples and I are one. And he means very clearly, not ontological, he means that they are one in purpose. That's, that's what he's clearly indicating. The, the Greek is the same uh, in, in chapter 10 and chapter 17. So, so to say that Jesus is claiming deity in chapter 10, you would then have to also say that he is claiming deity for the disciples in chapter 17 as well. Because the, the Greek is the same. And clearly the context is that Jesus and the disciples are one in purpose with, with the Creator. And that's, that's, the, mm. that's the clear teaching yeah, of, that's a good point. of that. Yeah, this is a very common point. Uh, this is a uh, point that Muslims raise uh, when this text in John 10 comes up as well. Uh, our biblical Unitarians also make this point. Uh, the problem is that we have to look at the context. In John carefully started at verse 22, not merely reading verse 30 in isolation. If we read verse 30 in isolation, well, yes, it could just mean that Jesus and the Father are one in purpose or, or something like that. But when we look at the context, we see that Jesus has just got done applying Psalm 95 and Psalm 30, uh, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy 32, 39 to himself uh, and then in that context and he also says i give them eternal life and they will never perish just as no one can snatch out of the father's hand no one can snatch out of my hand and then in that context he says i and the father are one and the jews understand exactly what he means because they pick up stones to stone him and explicitly say they're stoning him for blasphemy because he being a man made himself out to be god so would the jews also then be stoning the disciples in chapter 17 then because the claim in chapter 17 is the same 
No, we have to look at the context. So, well, well, I, I, it, I don't, I, in John 17, I don't believe that it's it's talking about a, an ontological unity. It's talking about an, a, a unity of, of purpose. Well, okay, we can we can always say that we don't think, but if if the Hebrew or if the if the Greek is the same, then why would it be different? Why because would of the difference different? of context, which is why I, I went through why the context is relevant okay. in John 10. Okay, all right. So you you brought up in in uh, in when I you said that we always try to get meaning from clear context to interpret ambiguous contexts. I'm trying to think of how could Jesus have been clearer than in John four in John twenty eight fourteen when he or in mean, 14, 14, 28, 14, 28, 14, 28, when he literally says the Father is greater than I. In other words. That seems to me to be a mm -hmm. very clear <clears throat> statement. So how could, what would be ambiguous about that statement? In, in other words, if I said that LeBron James is a greater basketball player than I, what would I mean by that? Would I mean that I was really as good as LeBron James, or would I mean that LeBron James was better than I am or greater than I am? Well, again, we have to look at the the text as a, as a whole. Um, we have to look at the context. Let me finish. So, um, yeah. and I, I already talked about uh, the preceding context in John 14. And in the next verse, in verse uh, 29, he says, um, and I quote, and now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. And compare that to you, Isaiah 41, 21 through 23, where right. God says, set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proof, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Do good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Um, Isaiah 48, 3 through 5, the former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth, and I announced them, then suddenly I did them, and they came to pass, because I knew that you are obstinate, and your neck is an iron sinew, and your forehead brass, I declared to you from old, from of old, before they came to pass, I announced them to you, lest you should say, my idol did them, I carved I, 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 image, and my metal image commanded them. So, likewise, Jesus says, and now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe, very similar to the language in Isaiah. So when you look at the broader context in, in even John 14, it seems to me that the uh, the deity of Christ makes the best sense of this passage, and you can understand the, the, the verse where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I, in light of um, the theology, even in John's Gospel, in John 17, 5, where he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. So he's regaining the glory that he shared with, with so, God, because so you, on this point, you, on this point... You allude, oh, go ahead. You alluded uh, to, to Philippians. Yeah, let, let me just uh, tackle that quickly, and then we can go to Philippians. If so you this, um, okay. Uh, well, in, in, the, in, the, in the laying, Jesus laying aside his deity... Basically, we only have Philippians chapter 2, and that that is probably as blasphemous a passage as I can possibly imagine mm -hmm. could be, um, because the, the text of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through uh, 11, I believe it is, mm -hmm. is that the Father, the Creator, has given Jesus... A name that is above every name. That's that's what the text says. Mm -hmm. And that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and every right. tongue confess. Okay, and that is that Isaiah is forty five twenty three. What you what you say? Forty five twenty three does not say that. It that is so. So here's Isaiah forty five twenty three. Uh, it says. By myself I have sworn, for my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Now, yes. uh, so Who's to, speaking? To swear, it's, it's God. Uh, well, to, to, no, no, specifically, what is the, what is the, what is the name of the person who is speaking? It's very it, clear in the it's text. The Lord God. It's, well, but his name is Yud and Hey Vav and Hey. That's that's right. the name right. of our Creator. That who's speaking, and he clearly says in Isaiah forty-five that it's my name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And then we get 
a, a another book, the book of Philippians, and the name completely changes. And it's no longer that at the name of Hashem mm-hmm. will every knee bow and every tongue confess. But now it's a completely different name, mm-hmm. a, a name that can't even exist in Hebrew, yeah, but it's true. a completely different name. And this is very prolific. I, I mean, I taught this in the church all the time. I was in the church. This was a, very, there was at least one or two sermons every year concerning Philippians chapter two. And I, to my great chagrin, had never read Isaiah chapter forty-five to learn who the name is that every knee com- bows to right. and every tongue confesses. Right. As Christians, so wait. So my that, well, well, yeah. well, wait. Not, not. Don't say as Christians. As answer this. How can the name change that every knee bows to and every tongue confesses? Keeping in mind that verse 21 literally, literally says, um, is it not I, the Lord, and there are no other gods beside me? He even says it right before right. that. For context yeah. purposes, don't think this could be someone else because I'm clarifying right here, two verses earlier, right. that this is right. the Yud, the He, the Vav, He, and that's it. And so now, there's not, the context not there. Only now is this, not only is this name equal in Philippians chapter 2, but Jesus Christ is a greater name than than Hashem, according to the text. Uh, actually, so as I was about to explain, as Christians, we believe that G- Christ, Jesus, shares the name of, of God, of Yahweh. But see, that's the problem, uh, though. It doesn't, how, there's no proof of that. Would, how that, would I know that? Yeah. How, how could I possibly know that when I'm reading Genesis to Malachi? What, what would be a... Okay. Um, Just let's, even let, let, okay. Let, let, let's um, let's let's address that. So um, let me. I, I want to uh, first address the point that William made, which is that uh, the Lord cannot share His glory with another divine person. No, He can't. He uh, said it won't share with any anything, anyone, any anything. anything. Yeah, nobody. Doesn't matter. Yeah. A horse, a cloud, a bird, you know, a so, sea urchin, a human, a figurine. He will not share His glory. Period. Yeah. Except uh, with the angel of the Lord, which is a divine person that is distinguished from Yahweh. Um, so in Genesis 48, for example, and you're familiar with the angel of the Lord passages, um, but in Genesis 48, 15 through 16, uh, Jacob is blessing the sons of Joseph. And it says, he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. What ver- I'm sorry, what verse are you at? I just want to, I want to follow you along. Me from all evil. What verse are you reading from? Okay, so Genesis 48, uh, 15, 16, it says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel or messenger, the Hebrew word is Melach, who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. The Hebrew word... The verb to bless here is actually in the singular, not in the plural. And so this uh, emphasizes that uh, this is actually Hebrew parallelism, where the God and the angel are are synonymous, interchangeable terms. Um, And you also have another parallelism. uh, But but the problem is it doesn't say, it doesn't say, it says, may the angel, but the angel doesn't say you'd have Ave. It says. There's there's no angel that is named Hashem, none. Hamalach. And when the angel wrestles. I just made. Well, well no, but, because oh, sorry, Greg, go ahead, sorry. Well, the the angel that wrestles with Jacob is a Satan. It's not an angel. It's not God. Okay. A Satan is the a Satan is the angel of Edom. Every nation has an angel. Hashem assigns a nation an angel. The angel that that Jacob is wrestling with is a Satan. That's who he's wrestling okay. with. We He's can go wrestling. to Genesis 32 in a moment, but let's stick with Genesis 48 for, for the time being. So, oh, I thought we so, were in 32. No, yeah, we're in Genesis 48. So uh, do you understand what the argument is, that there's a Hebrew parallelism here in mm-hmm. Genesis 48, where you've got the God, the God, the angel, and then the verb blesses in the singular. And so that implies, I think, strongly that God and the angel are interchangeable in, in, um, entities. Is there right? is no... So every angel is a created being. There is no angel that would be interchangeable with Hashem. So that, how do you make that sense would of be this text? the highest form would be the highest form of blasphemy to assert that. Hashem Hashem alone creates and Hashem alone is the father and the creator. 
Um, there's there's no a- angels simply do the bidding, including Satan. Mm-hmm. They simply do the bidding of Hashem. They this, don't this have any autonomy. Quick question. Uh, of, or or ahead, verse, verse 16, may the angel who redeemed me from all harm bless the youths and may and may may they be called by my name and the name of my fathers Abraham Isaac and Jake or Abraham and Isaac excuse me and may they multiply abundantly like fish in the midst of the land what part of that is is the part you're talking about so in verse 15 you have God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day the angel who is redeeming from all evil bless the boys, and the verb is in the singular, and the um, and this is the Hebrew parallelism. But blesses it can be in the singular. Right? Blesses the boy. I mean, how do you how do you pluralize bless? Havracha, havachot would be you know. Of course, I'd be a feminine version of that, but still, um, I, that doesn't prove anything. I, I, I don't see any proof of anything there. The only thing I can see there is a distinction between the, the tetragrammaton yeah. and yeah. the word the word angel, which is Melek, or so Hamalak in this case. Hashem, Hashem regularly dispatches angel, an angel to rescue Jacob, and the angel, the angel who redeemed me from all the evil, that's simply a reference to the angel that Hashem tasked with helping Jacob through the many trials of his life. This This angel is not the creator of the heavens and the earth. Well, the parallelism would suggest otherwise, but... Let me ask you this, Jonathan. Would you have... How would you know that an, a messenger, an angel, how would you know that, it, that they weren't created, that there was this one angel that wasn't created? And if, if that exists, why would he be a messenger... Uh, so, In other words, from a text, from from the text, from from Genesis through Malachi, give me, give me, it, uh, scripture, or give me really good context of a a angel that is God. Okay, so I, I'll give you that. I'll give you another example. So in. In Joshua five, if you understand that the angel of the Lord is actually worshipped, right? So no, it says, no, I'll, I'll stop you right there because that's a complete mistranslation of the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. Joshua prostrates himself in front of the angel. He doesn't worship him. I'm sorry, but that's that's very clear in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. There, there's no worship involved. The 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 Christian translators translated prostate as prostrate. I'm getting older, so I talk about prostrate more. <laughs> they prostrate, he prostrates himself in front of the angel. He doesn't worship him. So I, I'm sorry, but that's just not that's just not true. And you can when, you can look this up in any Hebrew Bible, and you'll see that that Joshua doesn't worship this angel, this messenger. He simply does obeisance, or what, he. What he was does, the What was the verse in the, question? By the way, this is, in, this is in Joshua five. five. Joshua. Um, but. Um, I mean, in the, in the context of the commander well, of the Lord's army says to Joshua, yeah. take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy, and Joshua did so. Um, a, 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 perhaps a clearer passage um, here would be well, in Judges. Well, let's, yeah. let's establish that this Joshua does not worship this angel. He, he, de- he, he does. Shows, yeah. No, he, he shows, shows obedience. Revelation, when John tries to bow down before the angel, he's told, don't do that, worship, worship God. Um, in a religious now, context, who, bow down before uh, translates into worship. When... What did you say? John bowed down before who? In the Book of Revelation, uh, John tries to bow down before the. Angels. Okay, that's okay. That's not Genesis to Malachi, yeah, right? <laughs> so, but, so I'm I'm trying to. We're, but in, we're, in a religious context, uh, but in a religious context, bowing down before translates in, into worship. No, but, no, that's uh, not that's not the case at all. That's not, it, it's that's just not the case. He again, Joshua is simply showing obesity. It even says in in a King James translation that it's obeisance. It's not worship. There's a difference between worship mm-hmm. and respect. Yeah. In other words, I could I could easily nod my head to you, and that's just me showing respect. It's not me worshiping you. So, so a clearer text then along those lines okay. would be in Judges 13, when the angel of the Lord, to Melechadani, appears <laughs> to Manoah and his wife to announce the birth of Samson, and. Um, 
we read, um, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord. 13 verse, please, what verse are we in? We're in verse 15 at the moment. 15, uh, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, yeah. please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And then... Uh, but he did say offer it Manoah, to the Lord. He didn't say offer it to me. Okay, yeah. And then Manoah yeah. said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? Well, that's, so when well, that's your pretty important. That's well, pretty let me important. Finish. Let me finish. Okay. Um, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, when your, what is your name that will be, uh, so that when your words come true, we may honor you. And you might recall that a similar response given to Jacob in Genesis But that's 32. not worship, though. Um, number sorry. one, it's not worship. And number two, okay. he, he clearly okay. said, offer it to the Lord, the saying that I'm not the him. Lord. He said, hey, offer it to the Lord. The angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? And then in verse 21, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. The Manoah knew he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. Um, and uh, yeah, so, it, and, uh, so they, they see the angel of the Lord in verse 20, ascending in flame, and then they, they fall with their face to the ground. And then they are perplexed with the fact that they've seen God, and yet they haven't yet died. See, so so the, they're, they're confessing right there that they were perplexed. They, they didn't understand what was going on. Same, same with Daniel. Daniel has prophecies, and then he goes in and he's troubled by them because he doesn't know what they mean. Does that mean that God doesn't know what he means because it's written in the scriptures? What you have to understand is in, in, in the, all of Tanakh, in the entirety of Tanakh, the first five books of the Torah and all the prophecies hidden within the prophets themselves, just the prophecies themselves are not subject to, to human failure. Everything else is subject to, to human comprehension, understanding. These, a lot of this stuff is documented things on how people felt and what they did. It doesn't always mean that what they did was correct, or uh, it doesn't say that they didn't understand it because God didn't understand it. Why, why, why doesn't it if, if this is clear, then why doesn't it just give the interpretation is, that is saying they were perplexed? This, this makes That's something you have to clear. understand. Yeah, if, you read, if you read the from the Hebrew... Um, it we're, happened that the flame rose up in the top of the altar. To hey, the Greg, heavens. Greg, where are you at, the buddy? The angel of Hashem, uh, and, and Judges 13. 13. The okay, angel of Hashem went up in the flame of the altar. Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell upon their faces to the ground. The angel of Hashem no longer appeared to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah realized that he was an angel of Hashem. Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen a godly angel. That's what that's the, from the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible right. says. Okay. They haven't seen God. This is this is where this is where I've asked several apologists why in other <sighs> words, the, the Hebrew Bible, and you, you made a, a point in your letter that a third and a third and a third of mm -hmm. Egypt and Assyria and Israel. The Hebrew Bible was only given to the children of Israel. They're the only ones that could read it for millennia. But yet Christian translators take the Bible and they change what the Hebrew says and they make it Christological. My question or to several apologists has been, why are they allowed to do that? In other words, why do the author, why do the translators yeah. <clears throat> of, of Judges, why can they change godly angel to Hashem? And How do you get godly angel? Well, the point is, uh, McClatchy, it doesn't it doesn't say the Tetragrammaton. It says Elohim, no, which which is which a, is not the God name of God. Angel. It says no. The Tetragrammaton does not appear at the, at the end of twenty one. The, the Hebrew text right now, I'm looking at it right now, and it says Ki Elohim. Yeah. It doesn't say Ki Hashem or Yud Hey Vav Hey. So I don't know what. Right. You, I, yeah. I don't. So, yeah. So every, so every reference in Judges thirteen to the angel of the Lord uses the Tetragrammaton. This I'm Every looking at it right one. now, and it says Elohim, Aleph Lamed Hey oh, Yud Mem is Elohim. Which verse are you in? This is verse twenty-two. 21. It says, and Manoah said to his yeah, wife, 20, twenty-one uses uh, the tetragram. Oh, oh, so, but here's here's the thing. Verse, does, yes. verse twenty-two is where it says. 22. Verse twenty-two is where it's, Manoah said to his wife, "We shall surely die because we have seen God." That word exactly. "God" is Elohim, not Yud Hey Vav Hey. Correct. Right. It's godly, godly angel. We've seen a godly angel. So it, I could. It does say that. Verse twenty one says that he saw an angel of Yudhevave, but whenever Manoah said to his wife, "We shall surely die because we have seen God," he doesn't say we. we he doesn't say that. He says we have seen Elohim, and that's not that's that's not the Chetragrammaton. That's not the Creator. But Elohim not, is is reference to deity. 
it is but it no, is referenced no, to the not. heavenly beings. No, so I can I could literally say if if I were alive in Pharaoh's Egypt, I could see so, Moses and I could literally so, say that I have seen God. Well, you have to and I would be by correct. The context, though, um, by the context, yes, and the context right. is that there are no angels, which are all created beings. There are no angels that are the Father, that are the creator so, of the heavens and the earth. That does not exist. That is not possible in the Hebrew Bible. But it is very possible for me to call Moses God, because in 7.1 of Exodus, Moses is literally called God. The Elohim. So would yeah. you assume then that Moses is God also? No. Uh, no, but we have to look at the, the context. Um, well, and, and uh, of course we do. <laughs> so, 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 what these various individuals that marvel at the fact they've seen the end of the Lord and yet their life has been spared? What they marvel at is so Exodus thirty three twenty. Um, what? Well, well, before we haven't we haven't God finished twenty two yet uh, of of the, of the chapter one. We we got twenty one twenty two because you brought up the point that it does say you'd have Ave. Right. Yeah. But the only it place it says say Yud Hey Vav Hey is where it refers to in verse twenty one, where it says was an angel of the Lord, not that the angel was the Lord. And then in verse twenty two, again, Manoah said to his wife, "We shall surely die because we have seen Elohim, not Yud Hey Vav Hey." Right. But Exodus thirty three twenty says he said, "You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live." And this is a very common response when one uh, sees God. In the Old Testament, including uh, Isaiah six, where Isaiah well, 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 Exodus thirty three twenty though, th there's a whole lot being left out right there. Okay, like so let me, let, remember, let me remember who the angel is that wrestles with Jacob. Who's the angel that wrestles with Jacob? The angel that wrestles with Jacob yeah. is Hasatan. He is the the That's angel sure. of Edom. What, yeah. what, what, so I'm sorry, I lost of my the Lord chair. also shows up in Genesis 32, as you mentioned. And he calls the place Peniel because he saw God face to face, and yet his life has been delivered. That's, uh, face to face as, as a man speaks to another, not, not, not seeing his nose and his eyes, but face to face meaning right. because it says later it's in the same area, it says that God speaks to the prophets through visions and dreams, but not okay. with Moses because Moses uh, face to face as one man talks to his friend. In other words, he heard him audibly. So the okay. context there is not is not eyes, nose, mouth. The context there so, is he heard him in real time. That's okay, the context. So would you agree that in Genesis thirty two Jacob has an interaction with God? Genesis thirty two. No. Let's let's get to it. No. In Genesis thirty two. No. No. He is he is battling with a Satan, with an angel of the Lord. A Satan is an angel of the Lord. Genesis thirty two. Yeah, so Hosea twelve four says that he strove with the angel and prevailed. So he so he uh, strove with the angel and prevailed. Right. Yes, but, with the angel. Uh, but in verse thirty, and what chapter? It says, uh, in Genesis thirty two. Okay, verse three. Verse okay, thirty it says it. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, "For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered." It's all uh, <laughs> yeah, Elohim. Yeah, again, again, it's not Yod Hey Vav Hey. It's Elohim. At least the part I'm looking yeah. at. Let me, let me read the rest of it. Make sure I'm not overlooking something. Uh, Jacob seventy saw uh, this kid. Okay, uh, I want to go back here. Um, Did I miss it? So then Jacob uh, said, "When he saw them, this is the camp of God, and he named the place Mahanaim." Is that the, is that the verse you're referring to, Jonathan? Peniel. Yeah. He named the place Peniel. What, what, yeah. So we're in thirty-two. Or three? I have I have seen the divine face to face, yet my life was spared. And that thirty the sun rose for him and is he that thirty two three? And the divine, the divine, the divine means the angel. Sorry, tell me what, what chapter and verse again. I'm sorry. Thirty one, thirty two, thirty one. Genesis, yeah, thirty, yeah. Oh, thirty two, thirty one. Oh, so, okay, that's that's why I couldn't find. Okay, thirty. Okay, read. Okay, good. So he has that. he has seen the angel. Uh, obviously, he Jacob saw the angel. Me, he wrestled an with angel. the angel. Yeah, it says I saw an angel face to face, and my soul no. was saved. Yep. Doesn't say doesn't say the tetragrammaton right. again. It uses Elohim. So I, I, I really wanted to. I, I had a few other things that I wanted to to really do um, because I really wanted, I really wanted an answer as to how the name changes. And and you, I, I mean, I just want. In other words, if if Hashem and by the way, do you agree, Jonathan, that you cannot add to or take away from the Hebrew Bible? Yes. I could was that yes? Yes, he said yes. yes. Okay, yes. All right. So how would 
how would the name changing from Hashem to Jesus Christ not be changing the Hebrew Bible? In other words, uh, so it it would be your contention that all along Hashem intended for Jesus Christ to be the name that every knee bowed to and every tongue confessed. But through Isaiah the prophet in chapter 45, he just used a name that's kind of like an interim name then for the for the people up until Jesus is born? Or how would you... So no one's arguing for a replacement. It, it's not that the oh, name Jesus the, replaces the name of God. No, it's, it's, no, it's an additional no, title. Philippians, Philippians chapter 2 absolutely replaces it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. no question. It, the name is above every name. And at the name of Jesus yeah. Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. That's the, very clear. The name Jesus is an additional name that... Uh, but you can't find that additional the, name anywhere in Tanakh, and that's the problem. Apparently appropriate. It's not appropriate because you can't find that name anywhere in the Hebrew Scriptures. Well, that's that's what I'm. That's what my point is. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to wrap my carpenter head around this because I am clearly told by the prophet Isaiah. I believe that the prophet Isaiah spoke the word of God, and I believe that Isaiah completely prophesies about the world to come, the messianic kingdom. And at that time, our Creator clearly says that at my name, yud Hey and vav Hey, that's the name that every knee shall bow to and every tongue confess. And then we get, in Philippians 2, we get a greater name than Hashem it's and a completely a name, different no. name. I, it says in the text that it is the name that is above every name. You just just read two verses back in Philippians chapter two. Yeah, I mean, I, I would understand the what? Um, the name here is is uh, his his reputation, well, as, if you will, for what he has accomplished in the cross. Well, well, no, no. Um, let's let's wait just a second. Let's just. I I don't think anybody should listen to my opinion. <laughs> I really don't. I'm going to just read what it says. Verse 9, Philippians chapter 2, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God of God the Father. So he gave him a name that is above every name. That's very clear in verse 9. And this is the name that every knee shall bow to and every tongue confess to. Because he is Yahweh. What's that? Because Jesus is Yahweh. Oh, my gosh. That's the teaching of Philippians 2. Let me, in the last, in the last couple of minutes, like you to comment on a few verses. Because in the letter that you sent me, um, you said that I had only given a few verses that kind of called into question Jesus divinity. So you you respond, okay? I'm going to give you um, the verses. Um, Jesus speaking, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Uh, that's John chapter five, verse 30. So I mean, just like, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So he, ha he so he's he's saying, don't just take my word for it. But he has a witness. Named, so in, in John uh, five, he says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears right. about me is true. Um, well, just just comment, just comment on. So now you believe that Jesus is God, that he is. You believe that he's the creator. But right. He, so he's saying if, it's not just if, his own words that people have to take for it. But as he says in no, verse 36, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father not, has given me to accomplish the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So in other words, there is evidence. Don't, don't read past it. I, I'm trying well, we to, to look get, at the context. Uh, we have to read past well, it. Well, okay, the context then. 
if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. How, in other words, that's just, just a statement that Jesus himself makes. How could it's he... It's a freestanding statement. How could his witness not be true? That's right. my question. So, as I was about to explain, so if you look at the context, we discover that he's saying that you know, it, it, the, the Jews don't just have to take his word for it, but the Father bears witness about the, the Hebrew Scriptures. But in verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me. To yet yeah, that's mind. a lie. They, they don't bear witness to him about anything. Yeah, there's well, there's well, nothing. The no, there's no. Okay, so the point of contention is that there for us there's proof that proves that there's none, but you don't believe it. And so just because you don't believe it doesn't make your story true. When we have, when it comes down to it, everybody knows that our world revolves around written documents. You sign a title to your house, you're not just going to shake a guy's hand and start paying him money without getting something written in writing. OK, uh, if there's anything that's an infraction of a law, it needs to be written down. They can't just say, well, you broke a law. Well, show me on, show me where it's written. Well, it's not written. Well, I didn't break anything. Everything has to be in writing. You're depending on your logic of reason rather than trusting what's actually written down. All the warnings that we have in Tanakh, all the warnings that we have, you're basically throwing them all out because you're wanting to reason with your own logic and how you feel and what Christians believe. Right. Instead of using what the text literally says, no, that's a huge problem. Every text in context, and uh, that's okay. That's okay. That's you, you keep right, stating the obvious. Let's, Obviously, let's, everything let's, has to be in context. That you say that every time, as if you're trying to devalidate what we said. Everything we're so, dealing with has to do with context. So that's fine. Well, let me put this one in context for me, then, if you would. Um, Jesus saith unto her, "Touch me not." For and this is different in Matthew. She can touch Jesus, but in John, she can't. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Yeah, so in, there. In Jer so in Jer Jeremiah 32, 27, we read, uh, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Now, John 1, 14 tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So if the Word, that is the Christ, became flesh and the Father is the God of all flesh, then what would that make the Father in relation to Christ? It would make him his God. Um, so, I don't <laughs> oh, so now you're saying that he would be his God, not he's not God. So, okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, Go how, ahead. How continue could, on. How could... How could the Father be Jesus God if God is God? Well, the and, Father and, and again, the Son are we're, separate we're persons, right? And so the Father, at the what point is, of the incarnation, voluntarily takes, uh, uh, voluntarily uh, submits his will to that of the Father. So there's okay, there's a few other texts that, that suggest this uh, in in the Hebrew Bible. So. Um, for example, uh, so in, 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 the, in the Bible, so in, he, in Hebrews 10, 5 through 9, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Okay. And I said, right, I'll stop you right there. But because no. that, that is absolutely a complete changing of Psalm 40, okay. verse 7. Well, let's that doesn't, it doesn't say that, Jonathan. That's, that's the point. Just... Just flip back to John to Psalm 40, verse 7, which 10 5 is quoting, and read what it says in, in Psalm 40, verse 7. That would be actually verse 6, I believe. Right. There's, there's, I, I'm aware there's a textual variant, but it's immaterial to the. No, no, no. Oh, no, it's wait, definitely wait, wait, material. Wait, 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 wait a minute. That's not irrelevant. And wow. let's do just a little mind game. So clearly, King David in chapter 40, verse 7 of Psalms is clearly saying, I, Hashem speaking, your burnt offerings and sacrifices I don't desire, but your ear I have opened. I want you to hear my word. The anonymous author of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 5, completely changes that and offers, puts in search that there's a body. But look and listen to that verse, 10, 5. Just listen to what it says. Burnt offerings and sacrifices you have not desired, what a, what a body for a sacrifice I'll give you. Didn't he just say in the beginning of the verse that he doesn't want burnt offerings and sacrifices? That was the whole point of Psalm 40, verse 7, that Hashem didn't want David's animal sacrifices and burnt offerings. He wanted him to hear his word. The author of Hebrews completely puts that on end 
and changes, again, the Hebrew Bible and makes the verse make absolutely no sense. That, that's my point with, with and, all of this. And if you, it, it and if you really think, sense. and if you really believe that that's irrelevant, then really we have nothing else to discuss. No, it's irrelevant well, to the argument that I'm making here. So let well, me finish the argument, and then we can come to address other things. Okay. So, um, so, according to, so according to the author of Hebrews, right, when does Christ come to do the will of, of his God, right? He comes to do the will of his God after he has received a body, after becoming human. Um, so he, he only has a God from the moment of his human conception. Um, Isaiah 49, 1 through 6, also is a, which is a messianic text. Listen to me, O coastlands, give attention to people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb and from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, and the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, and his quiver he hid me away. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, and I have being, I will be glorified, but it's, I, I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing, and vanity, it surely my rights with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. So again, in this text, the servant, said, the servant says Yahweh is his God, but this is after because he has the been servant, the womb to be a servant. The servant in 49, 1 through 6, is the prophet Isaiah. Very clear no, it's not. on the text. No, no, it's very clear Absolutely. from the text, it's not Isaiah. No. Um, who, well, well, from well, the mother's womb. So who, it literally says in chapter 20 of Isaiah that Isaiah is a servant, is the servant. He is a servant also. 49, 1 through 6, is Isaiah the servant. He is. He has the job of pulling Israel back. That's his job. From his mother's womb, just like Jeremiah, that's his, that's his, in other words, I have, com I have full textual support, Isaiah chapter 20, where it literally says, Isaiah, you are my servant, and then to 49, 1 through 6, where the servant is pulling out Israel, is pulling back Israel, and he has the quiver and the arrows, and he thinks he's failed. This also, 49, 1 through 6, can mean that the righteous remnant of Jacob is the one that's being used to pull the servant Isaiah back also. What is not present anywhere in the text, anywhere in any of the text that you just read, is that this is about Jesus. There is zero indication of that, that it's about Jesus. But yet I have clear indication. I know that Isaiah is called the servant. Is Jesus called the servant in the book of Isaiah? Israel would be, yeah. So that's um, just that's just a straight this, what, what, this well, is a, a like, straightforward question. Is is Jesus called the servant in Isaiah? Yes. Where? Where? In, I just need a chapter and verse. I need a chapter. Three would be a good one. Is that forty? No, no, just one, one at a time. Okay. Uh, McClatchy, okay. one at a time, please. Let's go to the exact yeah. verse and let's, let's look at let's look it up in thing. Hebrew. Okay. So give me the first one where Jesus is called the servant in Isaiah. Um. So. I, we're currently in Isaiah 49. Um, okay, Isaiah 40. Well, let me just, let me read it. Let me read it, because I read slow. Okay, what verse would you like to read from? 49, 1 through 6. I'm, I'm, yeah. I want a specific verse this, from Jonathan to say well, which one he's referring the, to. Which is the verse that well, talks of that yeah, Jesus is Again, the we want to read in context. Let me read it. No, no, so no, no. no. I'm, I'm just going to read. I'm, that's my point. I, I read. We're looking for a name. Isaiah chapter 20. We don't, we don't want, con we don't need. chapter 20. Yeah, and we don't I'll need context. Read, we need to see I'll, a name, a printed name. I'll read. Tell you what, I'll read one through six. Listen to me, O islands, and hearken, O distant regimes. Hashem summoned me from the belly. He mentioned my name from my mother's womb. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me like a smooth arrow. In his quiver, he concealed me. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I take glory. But I said... I have toiled in vain and used up my strength for nothingness and naught. However, my judgment is with Hashem, and the reward for my accomplishments is with my God. And now Hashem, who formed me from the belly to be a servant to him, said, I should return Jacob to him so that Israel would be gathered to him so that I was honored in God's eyes and my God was my strength. He said, it is insufficient that you be a servant for me only to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the ruins of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations 
so that my salvation may extend to the ends of the earth. So, so where was where was Jesus mentioned in those six verses? Uh, the whole six verses is about Jesus. No, no, so, we want a name, okay. McClatchy. We, we, I, I, I got to see a I'm name. Okay, let me let me go why to does it, Isaiah twenty. Why, wait, you just asked why does it have to have a name? Because that's what this whole thing is all about. Hashem's name is the Tetragrammaton, and you're saying that he shares a name, but there's nowhere. What we want is the absolute proof. What you're saying, not an idea that you've got. Not a feeling that you get from what you feel like this means. I'm talking about absolute text okay. proof that he in is in here. In so I don't 20, deal in absolute chapter, I deal in evidence. Does, well, okay. There is no evidence here, chapter, though. Let me, let me read this. Chapter 20 in Isaiah. Just as my servant Isaiah has gone unclothed and barefoot for three years. So I, I clearly establish here that Isaiah... Not I, I, I take that back, heaven forbid. I didn't establish anything. The prophet Isaiah establishes that he himself is a servant. Hey, is it okay? interesting to me that you diverge in your opinion here from Tovia Singer's view? Because this is not Tovia Singer's. We're not, we're, we're, this is not about Tovia Singer. We're trying to find Jesus here. It doesn't matter if it's Tovia Singer or Abdallah Hudala. We want to see what you say where Jesus is mentioned. That's it. So verse three says, "He said to me, you are my servant Israel, whom I be glorified.'" Um, and he, so here we have an individual that's given the title Israel, who is nonetheless distinguished from national Israel in verse five and six. Um, and now the Lord says, "He formed from the wind to be a servant to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored as the Lord, and my God has become my strength, and so forth." Um, and uh, you, you see also and in his, in chapter forty-two, where you have this distinction between the two servants, there was two servants in view in Isaiah. There is Israel, and there is uh, the Messiah. Isaiah forty-two just um, very carefully um, disambiguates between them. Uh, it talks about the first well, part of the chapter talks about the righteous servant, uh, the Messiah, and then the latter part part of the chapter from verse eighteen and following talks about the unrighteous servant Israel. And in Isaiah forty-nine, it's saying that uh, the the Messiah succeeds where Israel failed. So he is indeed the true Israel of God. Oh, okay. Lord. So so again, I I have established that. I'm establishing possibilities in 49, 1 through 6, and i very clear. Isaiah can be the servant because that's clearly he's a servant. What you said was that Jesus is contained in the text, and I'm going to call you out on that and say that there is no mention of Jesus or not a— Not by name, no, but the— Not the by mission, name. Okay. The mission only— The, the mission of Jesus. who? The mission so, of who? So— um, how would you apply, for example, Isaiah 53, which is talking about the same individual as we see in Isaiah 49, to oh. Isaiah? Indeed, um, how would you how would you argue that uh, the the Isaiah is a descendant of Jesse and David, according to Isaiah 11? How would you maintain that? Uh, I mean, there's you know, that he establishes. Well, um, I justice I know who I know who the servant is in Isaiah 53 because. I have literally been told time and time and time again from beginning at verse 40, chapter 40, I know who I know who the servant is. The servant is Israel. The servant is national Israel. That's who the servant is. I know who has no deceit in their mouth in Isaiah 53. I know exactly who that is. I am graphically told Zephaniah. who it is. Do you know who has no deceit in their mouth? In Isaiah 53. That would be Christ. No. No. That's not what it says. Look what at Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. Yeah. What does it Which say? Which is quoting the same thing. It's a repeat of the same. So language. Israel, so is the righteous remnant of Israel does not commit any, they don't lie. They do so not lie. A problem you're going to have there is well, well, in, Isaiah, wait, in I, Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, Woe to me, I am undone, I am of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for I have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So what's the problem? Sorry. We, I, did, I, didn't, I, I heard you say, here's the problem, but that I didn't actually hear the problem. Well, wait, a minute, wait 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 a minute. Let's back up a minute. So, so Zephaniah chapter 3 literally says that the righteous remnant of Israel, these are men and women, they have no deceit in their mouth. Okay, I'm literally told that. I don't Which have to wonder. Zephaniah 3.13. What? 
chapter 9, 313, I am literally told that they have no deceit in their mouth. Then I learn about the servant Israel, which it's always Israel. See, this is what I don't understand. I have place after place after place after place after place where it is literally stated that Israel is the servant. There is no place that it says Jesus is the servant, There's not one. A number of problems here. So th this point. Okay, was, what's the problem so, with so the here, Okay, okay. so th this point was originally brought out by Oregon. Um, but verse 8 and 9, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, you consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living, which is an idiom for, idiomatic expression for to be killed, stricken for the transgression no, of my people. No, from Ezekiel not, chapter 36, the land of the living is Israel. That's the land of the living. Let's go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, stricken for the transgression of my people. And my people throughout Isaiah refers to the, the people of Israel. And, they, and it's used like 23 times. Uh, and they made his grave with the wicked. I did. Rich Isaiah did. Oh. <laughs> and they made his grave mm -hmm. with the wicked and with the rich man his death. Though they had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So how can you say that Israel is cut off for the sins of Israel having himself done no wrong? Okay, because again, we have terrible mistranslations. I'll read it from the Hebrew Bible. We had all strayed like sheep, each of us, turning his own way, and Hashem afflicted upon him the iniquity of us all. Remember, this is the kings of the earth that are speaking. This is not Hashem. The kings of the earth begin speaking at the beginning of the chapter. In other words, all the kings of the earth thought that Israel has been, and Israel is a nation that has been afflicted for millennia. All the kings of the earth assume that Israel is afflicted because they killed Christ or because they rejected God. But he did not open his mouth like a sheep being led to the slaughter and a ewe that is silent before her shearers. He did not open his mouth. Israel, Israel has silently suffered for generations and generations. Now that he has been released from captivity and judgment, who could have imagined such a generation? For he had been removed from the land of the living. He had been removed from Israel. An affliction upon him that was my people's sin. The righteous of Israel suffered for the, not, not was atoned for, don't conflate the two. Israel has suffered because they did not trust Hashem. They have suffered and been in place of certain of the nations. He submitted himself to the grave like wicked men. Israel, he submitted so, himself to the grave like wicked men. And the wealthy of Israel submitted to his executions for committing no crime and no deceit was in his mouth. Hashem desired to oppress him and afflict him. If his soul would acknowledge guilt understand that if his soul is israel is in play not jesus hashem desired to oppress israel and to afflict him but if his soul would acknowledge guilt he would see offspring and live long days and the desire of hashem would succeed in his hand in israel's hand he would see the purpose and be satisfied with his soul's distress. Israel would see the reason that he has been oppressed for so many generations. It is their iniquities that he will, oh, with his knowledge, not his blood, with his knowledge, my servant will vindicate the righteous one, will will. Teach the righteous one, Hashem, to multitudes. It is their iniquities that he will carry. Therefore, I will assume him a portion with the multitudes and divide the mighty as spoils. The whole context, context, is who's speaking? The kings of the earth are speaking. Jesus never, ever in the church atoned for any sin with knowledge. It's always his blood. His blood is the only atonement for the church. In fact, Paul criticizes so how the knowledge. In the world can this servant, who you say is Jesus, now switch 
to where he is atoning with knowledge? That's a great question. Okay, so there are a lot of problems with what you just said. Um, so uh, wait for- a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to stop you right there. I just read from Isaiah 53. So I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I don't know what problem. Okay, I asked questions. What, what was the problem with what I read? Okay, um, m- many folds. So um, for one thing. Wow. Okay. So you want to interpret the speaker as the, as the nations, uh, and this is also what Toby Singer argues in his Let's Get Biblical um, series. Um, the, okay. um, but one problem with that is that so the, the first person singular pronouns are used consistently throughout the chapter by God, right? So as after 2.13, my servant, as after 3.11, my righteous servant, as after 3.12, therefore I will. And the onlookers in the text, without exception, Consistently speak in the first person plural, uh, as after three one, our message. Verse two, that we should look at him, that we should desire him. Verse three, we esteemed him not. Uh, verse four, our griefs, our sorrows, we esteemed him stricken. Correct. Verse five, it's the kings, our... the kings corporately, the kings plurally, all the kings of the earth who will be the gardeners of the Messiah when okay. he comes. But that's the context. There, what what is the problem with the plural in that regard? Well, the plural language ceases in verse six. Right, and so this implies that the speaker in these verses, whether that be the Jewish people or the Gentile we, nations, is no longer. We the have all strayed verses. like sheep. How is we not plural? Oh, we we have all strayed like sheep. Again, the king's speaking, and then he switches yeah. to he. Oftentimes, Israel is referred to in the singular. In the in the that in happens. The that happens a lot, songs, even in Israel Isaiah. Is often yeah, referred to as the yeah. singular. But every time you find a singular pronoun. Uh, it's referring to it's it's God that's speaking in Isaiah fifty three. So God was persecuted and afflicted when it says He in verse seven. He was persecuted and afflicted, but He did not open His mouth. I don't see the so plural. So God is the one that's persecuted. I I I'm not understanding how switching to the singular means so, that God is so speaking here. after you get past verse 6, it says, All we have like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The plural pronouns cease. And then um, it says he was he, oppressed. He was, mm-hmm. he was pers- who is the, who's the, the he? servant. Right. The servant. Yet, okay, who's yeah, the servant? Yeah. The Messiah. Who's, yet he opened oh, not his no, mouth. No, the servant is Israel. Like where, where, like, where does the term Messiah appear anywhere in the servant song? I'm just, I'm asking. I need that like you were going to give me well, verses where Jesus is mentioned in is, the text of this Isaiah. Is like, this is frankly just like the Muslim argument. Where does Jesus ever say, I, I, I God <laughs> worship me in these okay. exact words? Okay, uh, no, I didn't ask you that. You said that this is referring to where, the Messiah. Where, where, does I the Messiah just asked you, where does the word of Messiah appear in Isaiah 11? In Isaiah 11? Yeah, Messiah, you agree that's a messianic text. Is, it, is, there are many messianic texts, yes. Yes, and, so Isaiah and, eleven. And we, all of the but you, but you have to understand. But because the whole okay, the whole thing is, is most clear. of them don't have the this point. This is very clear in Isaiah eleven. Don't don't conflate this now. Also, we're not creating anything in Isaiah eleven. Well, in Isaiah eleven, we are specifically told, specifically told, that the Messiah comes from the root of Jesse. That David comes from the root of Jesse. Specifically told, we're not creating anything in eleven. We are creating. If we're going to if we're going to somehow make the servant be something that the text doesn't say it okay. is, then we would be creating something. In other words, there's no problem with the spirit of Hashem resting upon a stump of Jesse or a, a progeny of Jesse. He will be imbued with the spirit of fear of Hashem. So Does Jesus do have Isaiah the spirit of fear of Hashem? Then would well, no? That's a good question. Is does Jesus fear Hashem? Yes. What? Yes. You. you Je- Jesus. Jesus fears Hashem because yes. it, that's okay. I've never heard that. So, so okay, <laughs> I I will. Uh, I, I'll. So I'll God, try to wrap my God, brain around that. One. God, God fears God. <laughs> Fear is issues biblically is, is a holy reverence, and yes, Jesus revered God. Uh, no, that's not the. 
He fears God. Yes, it does mean reverence, but the reverence in the is it also has that innate fear of something that is so incredibly more powerful in us that we do fear that. The fear of Hashem is the beginning of wisdom. I have never so, heard a Christian apologist say that Jesus feared God. Never. Uh, that's that's a first for me. Mm-hmm. So because that that clearly uh, that that's a that's kind of a game changer for me but anyway anyway we have there is not okay i'm going to ask you this show me the reference of in from isaiah 40 through 44 show me where the text says that the servant is a messiah well, you've agreed that Isaiah 11 is about the Messiah. No, and no, I, would argue, I would argue that Isaiah 42, 49, no. 43 are all speaking about the same individuals okay. is spoken of in Isaiah 11. Tell you what. And that's demonstrable. Let's, through. let's do this just real quickly. I'm going to state a verse, all right? But you, O is this is Isaiah 41. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, you whom I have chosen— offspring of Abraham who loved me. All right, now I cannot get any more clear as to who the servant is there, correct? Yeah, correct. Correct, would you agree? Okay, all right, yes. so that's, so So, my posit is, based on this scripture, that Israel, the offspring of Abraham, are the servant. So now you give me yours where it says the servant is so- the Messiah. On, on that text in Isaiah 41, uh, yep. we read, so verse 8 and 9 says, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from his farthest corner, saying to you, You are my servant, I have chosen you, and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so th- this text actually reveals that far from being say about Israel's afflictions, uh, these those nations to wage war against Israel will in fact be subject to destruction. Um, and this uh, that point is also born at another prophetic text please, as well. Please don't please don't sidestep here, okay? I'm just I'm just trying to do a mind exercise here. We're trying to establish who the servant is. Okay. I said you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, the offspring of Abraham. Now you get to show me the verse that you have that says Jesus or a Messiah is the servant. So go ahead. A specific verse. Well, there's, it's a, not that there's well, just one specific verse. No, there has to be. Well, right here, there has to be, because we just showed you one specific verse where it tells you who it is, and you're telling us the, that it's not about them. You're saying it's about well, we Jesus. Context. You say that every time. That's so, that's, that is so, that is getting so old. Okay. Okay. We are all dealing with the same individual as is spoken of in Isaiah 11. That is part, part of the context is what, analysis. part of the context Wait. is what the verse that Greg just quoted. That's part of the that's context. You're wanting to erase so that. That's not, that's not context. You're trying to just. There are two just, servants in view in these chapters. Where's, servant, where are the two servant. servants? We'll Where go, for example, serve? to Isaiah 42, where we read about one servant in uh, verses 1 through 7, um, and then we read about the other servant in verse 18 through the end of the chapter. Yeah, verse 18 following, Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see, who is blind by my servant, who deaf is my messenger, whom I send, who is blind as my dad, blind as servant <laughs> How many times has the nation of Israel been blind and deaf? There exactly. is no two servants. It's still here. talking about Israel. Behold, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one whom my soul desires. I am a sham. I have called you with righteousness. I will strengthen your hand. I'll protect you. I'll set you for a covenant to the people, for a light to the nations. I am a sham. That is my name. I'll not give my glory to another, my praise to idols. After he clearly establishes who his servant is, then he says, who is blind but my servant and deaf? Israel has many times throughout their history has been blind and deaf. Is Jesus blind and deaf? No, that's why he's the other servant. What? That's why he's the other servant. Okay, okay. Oh, that's why he's the other servant. So how would I know that from the text? Where? Well, the text is right? So... 
Behold my servant, this is from verse 1, Behold my servant to my uphold, my chosen and my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not yes. cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wake he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice, he will not grow faint or be discouraged. Till he's established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Um, and, who brings, uh, verse who six, brings Simon, justice? Who brings justice Messiah. in the final messianic... Yes, and what's his name? What's his name? We're told his name multiple times. What's his name? David the Prince. David the Prince right. is the final Messiah of Israel. We're explicitly, graphically told this multiple times. But don't conflate the Messiah's role, David the Prince. See Hosea chapter 3. See Ezekiel uh, 34, but, see Ezekiel 36. That's don't don't conflate the Messiah's role okay. so and Israel's role. They both have a role to play. So now you're saying that Isaiah 42 is about David the Prince. No. Well, okay, Isaiah 42. Has keep, let's keep in mind that, that, that keep. we know we know who the final Messiah is. We know that he is a man. We know that he has children. He will live we know long. That he He'll... brings animal sacrifices yep. for offerings. We know that he has sin. We know that he has huge amount of property in Jerusalem, Israel. But we also know that he sits on his father David's throne, and we know that the kings of the nations. These, Jonathan, these are graphic texts. You can just read this for yourself. The show point me. I want to the point I want to establish right. here is that the whole Wait a minute, the whole he said show me something. I always like to show. Uh, one second, guys. One here. second, please. I was trying to get this in a little bit ago, but I couldn't get it in. The whole point about it, it doesn't matter if there's one, two, or three oh. uh, different servants mentioned in, uh, in, in Isaiah. It doesn't even matter. What matters is, is Jesus any of them? Is the Messiah in is, this regard, what you call Jesus, Jesus, is he any of them? That's the only question we're dealing with right now. Is, G is Jesus stated, so we have multiple texts where Israel is the servant. Multiple, multiple, multiple. We also have descriptions of this servant. He's blind and deaf. Yes, he is. Israel has been blind and deaf many times. What we don't have anywhere, anywhere in the servant songs, unless you can show me, is Jesus is the servant. Now, we can all do innuendo, and we can all do, well, somebody said, but I'm interested in what Isaiah said. And Isaiah doesn't say Jesus is the servant, but Isaiah does say that Israel is the servant. And if we're going to take 49 and, and make it messianic, which is possible, no question, or, or 42 and make it messianic, which is possible, then we would have to know who the real Messiah is, who the final Messiah is. And we are explicitly told that by the prophet Ezekiel, by the prophet Hosea, by the prophet Jeremiah. I I think that you have not heard those texts, possibly, Jonathan? I'm very familiar with them, yes. What? What? I'm very familiar with them, yes. Okay, all right. So then you I, you acknowledge that the, that the final Messiah brings animal sacrifices, possesses property, has children, has servants, uh, has sin. No, so I don't. Show, what? Me, show me show me where for example it says the messiah has sin uh well if he's going to bring his own sacrifices obviously he's going to bring sacrifices for his own sins and for the sins show of me, the nation show me the verse okay ezekiel but all the rest of it doesn't matter I'm, I'm curious all the rest of it is not relevant to you then jonathan well that's true too but i'm sorry what did you say I, can you not hear me is am i coming through clearly no you're fine Okay, okay. So, so all the other things that he mentioned about uh, we'll offer sacrifices and we'll we'll have children, and all, that doesn't bother you at all because Jesus never had any children. Yeah, I don't believe that it says that with the Messiah. Oh, interesting. Um, it says he will live long and have seed. Okay. Yeah. So seed it, zero. That's a that's a physical seed. You know that, right? That's a physical seed. That's not spiritual children. So that, that's upon available. upon we the upon the, upon the prince upon the prince shall be the responsibility for the burnt offerings, the meal offering, and the libation, on the festivals, on the new moons, and on the Sabbaths, on all the appointed times of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering, the meal offering, the burnt offering, the peace offerings to atone on behalf of the house of Israel. 
Which, that's Ezekiel what? Uh, that's Ezekiel 45, and that would be 17. Just a second here. I mean, that's pretty... I, I assume that you don't think Jesus brings animal sin offerings. Would that be true or not? Um, it's not clear to me that this is, talking, this is a messianic text. Well, of course it is. Yeah, yeah. And on the prince, and on that day, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering. That's Isaiah chapter 20, verse 22 of 45. Um, uh, when the prince gives a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, it belongs to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. And when he gives a gift of some of his inheritance to one of his servants, then it shall be till the year of release, Jubilee. Then it shall return to the prince. Only the inheritance of his sons is theirs. Uh, and the, the prince's possessions are described. They're, it's quite extensive, the possessions that the prince has in Israel during the Messianic kingdom. And 3424 kind of specifies that it's Messiah, too. Yeah, there's there's throughout right. the throughout it. Um, yeah, thirty four twenty four definitely is. Yeah, so it's yeah, talking about the yeah, prince will definitely yeah. offer offer and sacrifices. Prince, we are, we're explicitly told in Hosea in this third chapter that the children of Israel will abide for many many days with no sacrifice and no temple. No king. Yeah. But then David the prince will come. And he's though he reinstitutes everything. Everything gets reinstituted. All the animal sacrifices take place. All of the feast days take place. The king, the the prince, brings the offerings for it very clearly. We're not, we're not, we don't have to say well such and such says. E Ezekiel says this. Ezekiel says that the sin. By the way, who are the priests that make the offerings? Do you know? They are I the hate. sons of Zadok. The sons of Zadok, they are the ones that make the offerings in the temple. And the reason that they get to make the temple offerings in the Messianic kingdom is because their great 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 grandfathers did not go apostate when Israel went apostate. And so the sons of Zadok get rewarded, basically, and they get to serve and make the animal sacrifices for sin and conduct all of the feast days very clear very clear throughout ezekiel that all the feast days are kept not just the feast of tabernacles as some apologists maintain because that's the only one that's mentioned in zechariah chapter 14 but here all of the feasts are kept the sin offerings are kept what what are those sin offerings for what are those animal offerings for in the temple have you read that yet? Um, what are this, what are what are the sins that are covered by this by this offering of animals? Is, is Ezekiel forty five? I haven't studied for a while, so I'm okay. Kind of well, so it's they 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 are sense. for sins of mistake Accidents. and foolishness. Right. That's what sins are covered by the offerings of Zadok in the temple in the messianic kingdom. David the prince sits on his great, 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 great grandfather's throne, and the kings of the nations are his gardeners and his wet nurses. We are explicitly told that, that the kings of the nations serve the Davidic throne, serve the Davidic kingdom. So these are, these are very clear texts. What is not mentioned anywhere in any of this is Jesus. We don't we don't see any Jesus sitting on the throne of David. We don't see Jesus bringing so I, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this text. I don't think that the prince is the Messiah. So he's not able to perform priestly duties uh, according to Ezekiel 45:19 as no, Messiah does. He, no, uh, the no, the well he is a priest and the fact that David was a priest he just doesn't offer burnt offerings. The sons of Zadok offer the offerings. Of it course, seems he's more a priest likely to because me that he's no. Um, 
The priests are from the Kohenim, uh, from the Kohenim well, for sure, or the Kohenim family. So, so but, the but that's that's true because but they're a specific division of priests. Yep, right. Every the, Israelite Levites. is a priest. Levite. They are a nation. They are a royal nation, a nation of priests. That is Deuteronomy chapter six. A nation, a priestly nation. But the Kohen, which the sons of Zadok are descended from. They offer the burnt offerings and the sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem during the Messianic kingdom in complete contradiction to what Paul said that all of the animal sacrifices were done away with and there are no more animal sacrifices. And these animal sacrifices in the Messianic kingdom are for sins you commit by foolishness and mistake exactly like the offerings in the temple when when Levi was there were done. Which they is, were for sins of mistake. Yeah. Which, is, which is the way it's always been. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it is again. Blood in the sacrifices. And, and blood sacrifices so, are the weakest of all forms of atonement. The blood sacrifices are the absolute the weakest. weakest I find it interesting that the Christianity would use that as their target as well. Yeah. So. Oh, my. We have gone quite a while here. I'm okay. Yeah, we can go for another two hours if you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so again, I I bring up the exact places where the servant is called Israel. I have not yet heard a place where Jesus is called the servant. Hmm. We show in the in the final messianic era when the Messiah sits on King David's throne. And he is anointed to sit on that throne just like David himself was. All of those things that are conducted during the Messianic kingdom in Jerusalem, Israel, none of them are done by Jesus. There is Jesus is not present in any of these texts. There is no such thing. David the prince is specifically said. Now, there are there is some possibility of uh Different interpretations. The the it could be the high priest, the Kohen Gadol. It could be that he is the one that brings the the sacrifices to the sons of Zadok. But there's no there's no problem. Or there's no um, ambiguity about the sons of Zadok offer animal sacrifices for sins in the temple during the Messianic kingdom. There is not a Christian that I know of that would ever teach that. If you're aware of one, let me know. But they are not available for comment. And so, anyway, I try to go by what the text says because that's in, all in I context, can go by. in context, of course, in context, and I try to take as good a context as I can. I think I'm very clearly taught these things. Uh, the context, context can never trump graphic. In other words, if Hashem graphically states that there is no God but me, I am all alone. That is to add to the there's, context there's so you no don't make the mistake. To that. That's just a statement. When, when Jesus says, the Father is greater than I, when Jesus says, uh, I, I can't do anything. I can't even speak unless the Father tells me I can. And he literally says that multiple times. He says that he has been made. Um, uh, the first chapter of Romans, the first chapter of Hebrews, Jesus is made. Uh, mm -hmm. Very clearly, he's made. Um, we are told in the Christian Bible that Jesus is tempted in every way that we are tempted, but yet was without sin. That's in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And then we're also explicitly told in the Christian Bible in the first chapter of James that God cannot be tempted. And so I get real confused because if Jesus is God, then Jesus can't be tempted. But the Christian Bible literally says no context is required that he was fully tempted in all ways as are we, and yet was found without sin. 
So those two kinds of completely contradictory statements, this is not this is not nuance in any way, shape, or form. Those kinds, those kinds of complete contradictions led me to abandon the Christian church because there was no sense that I could make of it. And so, and then when I started actually learning the Hebrew Bible, not what Christians say about the Hebrew Bible, then I became fascinated and and saw truth, and I saw things that cannot happen in the Christian church. And hey. in the Christian church, you can't have sons of Zadok making animal sacrifices on the Temple Mount during the Messianic Kingdom for sin, because that would be that would be as gross a violation of Christianity as you could possibly get. So either Ezekiel is correct, or Paul is correct. Real and quickly, we've been two hours. Sorry. William. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I was going to say I've got plenty of time, but actually I don't. I've got another recording actually starting in eight minutes. Oh so my I, goodness. And I've, it's going to take me every minute of that to try to get this thing ready for him for uh, for the weekly parsha. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll go ahead and end it for now. And thank you all for tuning in, uh, Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. And uh, y'all should have a thank great week. So and we will catch you guys all on the oh, flip side. Yes. Good luck. Did, does the viewers know that Jonathan's wife is actually in labor? Right oh, that's awesome. Congratulations again. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. Take care, Thank buddy. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shaifa